Have you ever wondered why the controls on certain amplifiers and other bits of audio gear are not in the order you would expect to be rational? Such as, for example, this Mesa Boogie here, which has treble, then bass, then mid? Seems a little illogical at first, and you might just think they're doing it to be awkward or to be cool, but actually it's following the natural flow of the electronic circuit, which is treble, then bass, then middle. The reason for this is that the longer paths, if you have to jump back and forward, adds noise, it adds like an antenna. Every, every length adds more noise. We want short pathways with our circuits and we'd like everything to be in the order it has to be in as close as possible. It's not always po possible, but if we did treble, then middle and bass as what might seem logical on paper, Actually, we'd go into the treble and then jump across over to the middle control and then bounce back to the bass control on the circuit in order to have the controls on the front. So we can't really, really win. And if we have a look using this particularly cool little tool here, you will see that the Marshall circuit, typical Marshall, is indeed, signal comes in at the top left, that's this squiggle. It comes into the treble and then there's the bass, and then there's the mid. That's how the circuit works. In the Fender case, again, treble, then bass, then mid. Now, there are more complicated ways to do this, but in a simple case, this, this, this is what it is. Now, in the case of the uh, Grand Classic, the circuit is much more complicated. In the case of these amplifiers, the slight extra pathways on a passive amp make absolutely no difference whatsoever. Um, as much as Mesa were technically following the rules there and doing it the right way, it wasn't in, it's not gonna make any measurable difference. <laughs> Sorry. However, with the Grand Classic, the gains are much higher and there's a lot more going on, there's a lot more parts. So moving around the circuit creates more noise. So once again I'm changing the layout on the Grand Classic to do with this because I made the prototype board up the beta, 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 beta uh, board and I used it to debug and I found a few errors and I ironed them out and it sounds fantastic apart from the fact that it squeals like it's being murdered sometimes. And I figured out, pretty sure, that it's to do with the pathways being too long, too much bouncing around the board. Because when I did the original alpha on the breadboard, so the breadboard's like a plastic board with holes, and you can just push things in and jump wires around, there was no noise. And those boards are usually notoriously noisy. So if there's no noise on the breadboard, well, do what you want with the circuit board. And so I, I put all the parts on the PCB um, in the ways you'd expect. This is, uh, here we go, it's a PCB now. I put them all on and some of the parts, as you can see it's quite complicated, weren't where they probably optimally should be because it can be quite hard to figure this out. I mean, obviously it's hard just looking at it, but even for me, I'll show you an example of this that you might like. So if I find a part, let's see if I can find an interesting part. Here we go. This capacitor here, so if we grab this, the software gives me two little wires stretching to the two places it's supposed to be connected. The red one is the one I've already drawn, the yellow one is the one I haven't yet drawn. And you can see that it goes near this lump here and near this little C3 here. But it doesn't have to connect there. Sometimes parts connect to multiple points and this is where things get tricky. So if I was to put this part over here and then say find the nearest point, now it's connected to something else. It's now connected to C39. I, I, I didn't necessarily want that. That's maybe not the shorted path. It might be electrically correct. We stick it right down here and do it again to be more dramatic. Refresh. And now it's connected to this little green dot on the edge of the thing. Those are electrically viable. They're both correct electrically, but the one that nearest the chip where it's supposed to be is going to keep the pathway short and make less noise. So, I'm currently having a total rework of this board, which is what this is, and I'm not going to go into too much more, but basically I'm putting all the appropriate parts next to each other. 
So this chip here, which I move it around, is right underneath the amp control here, which is what it's connected to. So there's the shortest possible path for everything. This is very, very cool and very big hard work, but I think this is, this is really the final stage. What it does mean, much like the Mesa, is that some of my control positions have had to move again to optimize this. Before, I liked the idea of having the gain and level where the higher mids are, and so that's what I had. But it turned out that on the board, this meant a lot of moving around the board with the signals. The input goes immediately from the input to the, so we go from this input jack to the amp first to color and modify, then we go for the gain and level, and then we go for the EQ. And it sort of meant that we were coming down to the gain and level here in the middle, then we were moving down to a higher gain chip, then we we're coming up and going down and coming down. It was a bit of a mess. And so now instead, the internal flow follows the controls quite accurately for shortest path. So from the in, we go to the amp control, which the chip is under. From there, we go to a gain chip, which is just below it in the middle here of this, this is, and that is controlled by the level and gain controls, which are quite close. Technically, they would have been closer if we put them where the high and mids are, but we'll come to that. Then from there, it goes down, the search goes down, and the other chip, the third chip, is right down here, because that's where the space is near the growl control, and that is linked to the mids, high, low mids. So the signal comes in through the amp, through the gain, through the level, through the mids, the low mids, the growl, the crunch, the high, and then back up through the relay and out. So quite a clear pathway. It's like a little cross, comes down, around, and up. And hopefully that's gonna solve any and all noise issues. And of course, unlike the uh, the Marshall we were looking at earlier, and the Fender earlier, so this, this is much more complicated, and I'll show you an example of why that's such an important thing to have that additional complexity. So going back to our Marshall, if we grab the middle slider and try and move this mid control, this is the range of sweep we get. As you can see, there's not a lot happening there. It goes from slightly scooped at max down to uh, moderately scooped at min. So we haven't got really full, what we call full range control. And same with the other controls, like the bass control just sort of does this. It just changes, just sort of changing the frequency and the cut. They're not really, they're not. and the Fender's no better. The Fender's slightly different. The Marshall has a different sort of curve. The Fender has a sort of more bass and treble sound where the Marshall has a different sound. And again, if we swoop the mid, there is very little happening there. No matter what we do, even at max, you've got a mid cut. Whereas if we use the James EQ, on this, which is uh, a more complicated EQ. This has much more control, for example. We can sweep the bass from down to up. Look at that, proper from cut to boost, and again, treble from boost to cut. And so th this is why we use the additional complexity. So the mid control in the Grand Classic has an incredible amount of power in it. Um, the high control is very, very tailored to be uh, smooth in certain ways. And even the switches themselves, the growl crunch, they're not just like a capacitor strapped across something. They're full active circuits. So yeah, I, I think this is going to be really cool. Um, I'm optimistic this is the last front panel change. I think it still looks good, actually. Do you know, I, the more I look at it, the more I'm getting used to thinking it actually it looks a bit better having gain at the top right and level at the top left and the EQ below, because it kind of clusters the switches and the tone controls together, which feels right. And the amp control is really part of the gain structure. It's, I mean, it is fundamentally a tone control of sorts, because of the way it works and where it is, and it changes the tonal harmonic structure. It's more, to me, it's more about gain coloration. So I think that makes sense, having the top three, plus it follows the circuit naturally. So I'm really, I'm really pleased with this in the end, and hope this will all come together and, uh, yeah, there we go, really, that, that's, um, that's that. So yeah, if ever you see something odd on a piece of equipment, some strange sequence of tone controls or things, next time you can know that generally means the designer's actually been trying to do the best possible lowest audio sensible route for you. It's as simple as that. <laughs>